Today, I'm very, very excited to introduce Liam, uh, who's just completed year 11. Um, he's worked on open source projects online, and he's currently a software developer in his free time. One such project is V, uh, which he will be talking about today. So without further ado, I'll give it to Liam to present his talk. Hello everyone, my name is Liam and I'm a high school student currently in year 11 with a healthy interest in computer science, physics and computer graphics. I myself am an open source contributor and organization member for the V programming language, working on the compiler's backend and standard library, being the main person to call for WebAssembly. Programming and learning about its theory is where I put most of my time now. How I even got here to chant, how I even got the chance to present is because I attended the computer science fellowship here. I take info 1110 like some of you here, that's the course I'm working through. My main editor is VS Code because it's the most complete and works well. And for everything else, I use Helix because it's better than Vim. And for operating systems, I use FreeBSD on all my servers, Arch Linux on my PC, Alpine Linux on my laptop. For programming languages, I write C and V every day. And I have a pretty broad knowledge on x86, 64 and WebAssembly because I've used them as a binary target for the compilers I write. TypeScript and web dev stuff I know pretty well, and I've always wanted to learn RISC V and Haskell. If you want to email me, it's up there. And if you want a more convenient contacts, you can read the first page of my website. My first introductions to V were quite interesting, but in order to explain how I got here, I need to explain where I came from. I started programming a couple of years ago. I had experience before then, but this was a part of my life where programming started to make sense. I made some minor programs in Python, just figuring everything out. And after writing a couple of Discord bots, I took some time to learn C. I wanted to learn C because I realized early on that I didn't really understand how anything worked. And yes, what you're seeing is real code. 15 year old me had no idea what a guard clause was. C was an interesting programming language for me. I took a month learning the ins and outs and it subsided Python pretty quickly for personal projects. Around that time, I just got my new website up and wanted to create a 3D render with a twist, rendering to the terminal. Now that same 15-year-old me spent a month implementing it, one that rasterized Blender models created by a Python plugin straight to the terminal. I documented my progress in a four-part series on my website, one that working up from a simple linear algebra to full 3D projection matrices. I had pretty fun time, especially so with not having much experience in C or handmade computer graphics. Figuring out self-occlusion and mesh importing, it was nice learning C and a pretty good transition from Python. That was my first large project, and I was getting the hang of programming on my own. However, I wasn't really satisfied with either C or Python. I was at a crossroads. I came from a pretty extensive background with C and Python, but neither were able to fit my needs. There are a few th good things about C that I really admired. Explicit data-oriented code operating on simple data types. Value types are also explicit with zero abstraction overhead. You get what you see and you use what you use. Reasonable control flow. There's a good reason why modern programming languages are shifting away from try-catch. It's slow, annoying, and barely explicit. This is a huge proponent of Rust, Zig's, Go's, and V's design, with Zig making it a part of their entire philosophy. C runs everywhere. It's portable in the sense that you can't write a shared library with Python. If you want your programming language to interoperate with the rest of the world, it must speak C. C was also the first programming language to get address sanitizers and a huge amount of tooling like debuggers. C has static types entirely enforceable at compile time. The main advantage of static types is that they're exactly what they are. They're exhaustive. You can be confident that all call sites conform to the type just by letting the compiler do its thing. Statically typed languages also have the huge advantage in tooling with IDEs being able to produce a lot of information about your code, aiding in instant refactoring and code completion. Well, Python is more muddy, but it still has some good points. For one, a do things quick and do things now mentality. It's a great language for prototyping and all features of the language complement this. It has a huge ecosystem and package manager reach, reaching absolutely anything and everything. Its standard library is actually pretty sane, unlike C's, sometimes inconsistent and non-existent standard library. Python has a decent string type, C doesn't. And it's the language you teach beginners. Beginners need to worry about types. They need to understand basic algorithms and concepts like iteration and recursion. 
Python is a great language for this, and its syntax is pretty easy to understand. This list isn't exhaustive. It may even be biased, but a compare and contrast to put things in pers into perspective is what is needed for next. C programs are easier to reason about than Python programs, and Python programs are quicker to write than C programs. Why can't we have both worlds? And where does V slot in? This is what I want to accomplish with this talk. Introduce V as an open source programming language and community, teach a language to newcomers, allow the audience to understand why V makes the choices it does, and insert V as a real competitor for writing maintainable software fast. What is V? V is a modern programming language created by Alexander Medvednikov in 2018. It's a simple, fast, safe, compiled language for developing maintainable software. It's similar to Go, and its design has been influenced by Oberon, Swift, Rust, Kotlin, and Python, and promotes writing simple and clear code with minimal abstraction. It has many qualities that work to its advantage, such as a simple expressive syntax, hot code reloading, and test runners baked right into the language. I've never experienced a single debug build take longer than two seconds, and I work on the compiler. Expect the average program to take less than a second. By default, V compiles to C, so it leverages existing C compiler infrastructure optimizations. That property allows it to run everywhere. You can run the compiler on Windows, develop on Linux, and as I speak, I've got free BSD servers at home running it. Sounds exactly what I needed. How did V come to fruition? Something, something similar to what I went through. In 2017, Alex was writing a native desktop client for major messaging services called Vault. Initially in Go, Vault was rewritten in C due to better integration with graphics and UI libraries with smaller binaries. Go wasn't suited for the job. Its huge runtime doesn't always work to your advantage, especially when you simply don't need those features. Graphics libraries rarely support some kind of concurrency. OpenGL just doesn't. C was the only option, but C development isn't very productive. It's a tough pill to swallow, especially for purists like me. I mean, I love writing C, but I don't lie to myself. It's not very sustainable, especially when you want to ship something useful. So Alex created a new programming language to fix the problem. He created the V language to rewrite Vault, open sourcing it on June 22, 2019. Well, where do I fit in? I entered the programming language community back in late 2021, looking for a programming language used as an alternative to C and Python, because that's what it felt like to me. It was a complete breath of fresh air. I was able to write programs quickly and efficiently, efficiently leveraging the simple syntax. I've created about 21 long form articles on my website and about 150 short form posts on my blog. In early 2023, after creating a couple of compilers and languages on my own using V, I wanted to improve the language. I started major work on the compiler and standard library implementing WebAssembly support as a language target and as something you can just import and use as it was right in the standard library. I'll be touching on this throughout the talk. I've been a member of the V community for a while now, and I've had the opportunity to voice my ideas and key decisions. I mentioned some of the projects I've worked on in V. Early 2023 is when I started to, come, to become more involved in my open source contributions. Like I said before, my largest contribution was the WebAssembly work I did on the V compiler and standard library. I've, re I've written parts of my website in V, a couple of compilers and interpreters, and an entire programming language, STAS. The STAS compiler is entirely self-hosted, however, STAS1 was bootstrapped from a compiler rewritten in V. I use V to create the initial reference implementation of the language and compiler. You'll see, why was a, was a lang you'll see why V was a language of choice later on. As of writing this, and probably out of date now that I'm saying it, V is the third most written about topic on my small blog, fitting as the entire website itself is written entirely using V, using its SQL ORM support and built-in HTML templating. And that render I talked about before, it got rewritten in V days later. I'll make this quick and informative. The V compiler is housed in a single binary named V. It's designed to be simple, no build script needed. Invoking V on a file will compile it to an executable with the same name, and prepending run to the command will run the executable after compilation. V outputs binaries by default, compiled by a C compiler. It can also be configured to output C code, JavaScript, WebAssembly, and native executables. It doesn't tie you down to one platform. C and JavaScript targets are the most complete, with WebAssembly following behind, and native executables being a work in progress. However, a lot of work is being done for native, and we just got linking working pretty recently. For WebAssembly compilation, it has two different sub-targets, one for compiling for a browser, and one for running WebAssembly outside of your browser using WASI. WebAssembly for the browser exposes a way to interact with host JavaScript code as well. There's an example in the V repo that shows how to use the browser target to compute the Mandelbrot set, 
calling out to JavaScript functions to plot it on a canvas. Functions are declared with the FN keyword. A typical V program starts with the main function, which is the entry point of the program. Use functions in any order, even out of order. You can use functions before you declare them. Types also come after the name. If you use any modern programming language created after the year 2010, this should be the norm for you. The add function takes two arguments, both of type int and returns an int. Functions can also return multiple values using a sort of tuple syntax. Another deliberate design decision of V is that it doesn't have tuples. These are merely only applicable for functions that return multiple values. Later on, I'll show you how to work with these. V is a very modular language. So many programs should be organized into modules, which are located in separate folders within the project. The root of the module can either be the project root or the special source folder. At the root of the project, there should be a v.mod file with a description of the module. V is very opinionated with naming conventions and code style. Sometimes it will even reject your program if you don't follow these. All variables and function names must use the snake case style as opposed to type names, which must use Pascal case. This is yet another deliberate design decision enforced on the compiler and formatting level. Enforcing an, enforcing an opinionated style on all code allows for a consistent experience across all V code bases and makes things even easier to read. V has a special built-in code format, VFMT, which brings code to a single style. Variables are declared with a colon equals operator, with their type always inferred from the right-hand side initializer. By default, variables can't change. This is called immutability. V makes the ability to edit variables explicit using the mut keyword. Without it, reassigning is an error. This may seem counterintuitive as at first, since variables are supposedly designed to vary, but you'll see how this comes into play. Not often do variables change. I haven't mentioned data types yet, but you can probably guess what these are. V has built-in support for strings, and V uses UTF-8 to encode them. All strings in V are immutable. You can't edit individual characters, only create new strings. Use backticks for character literals, which are represented as single UTF-8 code points. For numbers, by default, if you don't specify a type explicitly, the literals will be of type int or float64, depending on whether it is an integer or a float. There is an exception to the rule that all operators in V must have values of the same type on both sides. A primitive type can be converted to another type if there is zero loss of information. For example, small integers can be converted into large integers, and integers can be represented as floats. If you want an exact type, you can just use casting. It looks like a function call with a type on the left-hand side. You've probably seen the print ln function, or print line. Among this function, the print function, and its variants that print a standard error, they all take a single argument to print. They can take any type and print it to the console. An amazing feature of V is that it has string interpolation on a language level, similar to other high-level languages like Python, and something you can't mess up, unlike C format strings. You can use the dollar sign and curly braces to insert values into strings and print them. You can perform variable assignments with multiple variables on one line. Remember the swap function from before? This is how you unpack the values. You can also ignore values with the underscore, which is a special identifier. The assert keyword is used to test for a condition, and if it's false, it aborts the program. I'll be using asserts from now on to convey the expected output of a program. If expressions are pretty straightforward and similar to most other languages, but notice how I didn't say statement there. If can be used as an expression, and the last expression is the value of a block. Unlike C and other similar languages, there are no parentheses surrounding the condition, and the braces are always required. If you're using if as an expression, the else branch is mandatory. There is no ternary operator in V. It's been merged straight into the if. V has only one looping keyword, for, with several forms. A range iterator is used to go through a range of numbers, not including the last value. It's similar to the range function in Python. V also contains a traditional C-style for loop and a special in keyword for going through elements of an array or map. V also contains a traditional C-style for uh, an index is required an alternative form with another variable can be specified. The for loop also replaces the while loop present in most other languages, and you can use it to loop forever by omitting the condition. Break and continue keywords control the innermost for loop, like you've seen. Break terminates the inner for loop. Continue skips the rest of the current iteration and proceeds to the next step of the nearest and closing block. You can use break and continue followed by a label name to refer to an outer loop. No need to use go to. V has built-in support for arrays, and array literals are lists of expressions surrounded by square brackets. The type of an array is determined by its first element, 
and the user can explicitly specify a type for the first element by casting. The above syntax is fine for a small number of known elements, but for very large arrays or empty arrays, there is a second initialization syntax. Below creates an array of 10,000 ints, all initialized with three, with memory space reserved for 30,000 elements to allow it to grow. Think of it as a list in Python or a vector in many other programming languages. It's a simple realloc when the array exhausts its internal capacity. To append or push to an array, use the two greater than signs, the shift operator. An array also has a special fields to get length and capacity. You can take slices using a range inside square brackets. If a slice, a slice is part of a parent array, and it has the same array type. If the right-hand side index is absent, it is assumed to be the array length. And if the left side index is absent, it's assumed to be 0. You can also take a slice of a negative index, which counts from the end of, of the array. It has a special syntax, the gate, which looks like a hash character followed by square brackets. The return slice is always a valid array, though it may be empty. V also has a syntax for creating arrays with fixed size, which live on the stack, for use with temporary buffers and other such things. Like all other data types in V, arrays have convenient methods to manipulate them. Functional paradigms are encouraged, and V provides functionality like filter and map combined with the test it expression to manipulate each element. V has support for maps, sometimes called hash maps, dictionaries, or associated arrays in other languages. Like arrays and structs, a map seems deserving a built-in status, and V follows suit like other compiled languages like D and Go. Maps are ordered by insertion, like dictionaries in Python, the order is a guaranteed language feature, and you can iterate over a map in the same order it was inserted with its keys and values. These maps are one of the most performant out there, and if you've read the thesis used as a base for the implementation, you'll probably know why. A structure is a data type that allows you to combine several other data types into one, into one with unique names for each. Nothing new here. In V, structures are specified using the struct keyword. Each field must have a unique name. To instantiate a struct, use a struct literal and specify each field. field. Fields can be initialized in any order or omitted when they're created. There are no un uninitialized data in V. When a field goes unspecified, it is set to the default value of its type, usually zero, or the field's default value. There is also a short syntax for instantiating structures without fields, but all expressions must be in order with correct types. V introduces access immutability modifiers for each field of a struct. Being able to specify whether a field is mutable or not within a module or outside a module is a very powerful feature. Combining this with the pub keyword on a struct or any symbol, you can create a well-defined API for your module and specify which fields are mutable, private, and which are not. V doesn't contain OOP. It's simply not needed at all, and is substituted with modern methods of data abstraction, like some types, interfaces, and generics. You can define methods on structs, and they're just functions that take the struct as the first argument and aren't polymorphic. Before the function name, a new parameter is added before the a new parameter is added called the receiver. It defines the type of the structure that the method belongs to, as well as the name of the variable, through which you can access an instance of the structure on which the, on which the method was called. There's another feature called struct embedding, which is like inheritance without polymorphism. It's just a way to compose structures together. On the code above, developer is a person, can access all of its fields and methods. Under the hood, developer just has a person field. It's a pretty, it's a pretty powerful feature, just being, despite being just syntax sugar. V doesn't have nulls. Instead, it integrates a concept called the option type to handle the absence of values more gracefully. Null values are an explicit part of the type system and a first class type, which means you can use them as function parameters return values, struct fields, and so on. The option type serves as a container that can either hold a value or represent its absence. An option must be unwrapped before using it, and I'll touch on this in the coming slide. V, doesn't, v also doesn't have exceptions. All control flow must be explicit. V represents errors using the result type, not stack unwinding, forever propagating exceptions that will kill the program if you have no idea they're there. The result type is similar to the option type, and instead of representing the absence of a value, it represents the presence of an error. It's pretty funny when even TypeScript to this day doesn't have a way to express whether a function can throw in its type system. And in C++, exceptions are an opt-out feature resulting in pointless conditional branches and generated code. When errors are represented as values, they become an integral part of the program's data flow. You can instantly tell what functions can fail and what functions can't. And if you don't handle them explicitly, 
the compiler will complain. This is more predictable and understandable, making it clear how errors affect program execution. B doesn't allow you to ignore errors. If an option type or result type is returned from a function, then you must process it before using its value. The first option for handling errors or none is propagate them up the call stack. This causes the current function to return an error or none as its result, and is similar to just letting an exception bubble up the call stack, except this time it's explicit. However, for, for a function to return error or none, its return type must be the result or option type. Thus, to propagate an error or none higher up the call stack, the enclosing function itself must return an option or result type. There are two ways to handle these types. Unwrapping is the process of extracting a value from an option or result type. All blocks allow you to describe the behavior that will be formed that will be performed if a function returns an error or none. The all block must be unwrapped in curly braces. If the function returns a value, then the all block will be ignored. V uses the last statement in the all block as the value. So the following example on the board will return a default answer, a default user, the struct literal. Another way to handle errors or none is to use if unwrapping. On the example on the right, the function returns a value. If the function returns a value, the if block will be executed, and the user variable will be assigned to the value returned by the function. If the function returns an error or none, the else block will then be executed. Trying to use a value that is wrapped in an option or result type without unwrapping will result in a compiler error. Everything is explicit here. Interfaces in V define some form of behavior in, in the form of methods or fields. Interfaces can be implemented by any type that has the appropriate methods and fields. They're basically conventions by which types can work together. This is real runtime polymorphism. When we define a function that takes a speaker interface as an argument, we abstract away from the initial implementation and only use what the interface defines. You can, you can now call greet with any type that implements a speaker interface. A type implements an interface by implementing its methods and fields. There's no explicit declaration of intent, no implements keyword. This is called duct typing. They just have to be compatible. V takes the path of composability instead of inheritance. And it's a good thing. In this case of interface embedding, all methods and fields of an interface will belong to the parent interface, and the type will need to implement methods and fields from all interfaces. For example, if you have two interfaces, reader and writer, you can both declare a reader-writer interface that requires the implementation of both read and write methods. All structs that implement reader-writer will also implement reader and writer, and their methods must mutate the struct, as the interface methods are marked as mug. Interfaces aren't often the most used by me. I resort to sum types. A sum type is a special data type that can hold a value of one or several types while maintaining type safety. Unlike interfaces, which can have multiple implementations, some types have explicit states. I'm constantly using some types in my V code. They solve a lot of problems. They go by different names, like tag unions, variants, algebraic data types, et cetera, and other programming languages. Let's say you need to represent a tree data structure. You could do it like this. The tree type, the type tree is a sum type. It contains only two valid states, empty or node. You, you can use a match expression to match on the type of the sum type, and perform different actions based on the type. It's entirely type safe, and the match expression ensures you've handled all cases exhaustively. In the node case of the match expression, the variable tree is of type node, not tree, not empty. And you can access its fields. I'll touch more on the tools present in the V compiler. V has built in formatting, testing, profiling, and a centralized package manager. You can use the V compiler to do package operations, just how you can use it for compiling code, formatting code, vetting code, and et cetera. Submitting your V module takes a couple of seconds, and installing modules is as easy as V install package. V's VPM currently has about 500 packages, and it's growing. Testing in V is similar to Go. Like in Go, test files are usually located next to the code under test and have the underscore test suffix. Each test function must be prefixed with test underscore and shouldn't take any parameters. Inside the tests themselves, the assert statement is used for checks. If the expression inside the tree is not true, the test will fail. You can run all tests in the current directory with v test dot. You can work with pointers in v. They're called references here. v extends mutability rules to references, so you can have immutable and immutable references. Due to these strict rules, you cannot edit a variable through an immutable reference due to the backing value itself being immutable. 
While you can dereference a reference with a star operator, you can edit fields of a struct through a mid-war reference, no dereferencing syntax required. References don't hide anything. They are pointers under the hood. All references created in safe V are always valid, and you'll never have to worry about them being null. When working in unsafe code, for example, when calling out to C code, you can create null references. I'll talk about C interrupt later. Nullable references are not supported in safe V and they're not needed. Option types exist and should be used. The V compiler by default performs escape analysis to determine when to allocate variables on the stack or the heap. Returning a pointer to a local variable from a function is undefined behavior as that local variable we invalidated in return. It's a constant pain point in languages like C and C++. V solves this by doing it for you. It's safe to return a reference to a local variable as V will automatically promote its allocation. Swift does this, Go does this, and even some optimizing C compilers do this, do this as well. In the function return reference, the compiler can easily see that the local reference value is returned and it will, it will promote the allocation of foo to the heap. In the function use reference, it doesn't escape the function, so it will be allocated on the stack. How I see it, V is able to assume and perform this analysis because it doesn't allow global mutable state. This will help you understand. V doesn't have global variables. It's always an opt-in feature. No global variables at all, only constants. This seems like we're walking backwards here, but not really. In multi-threaded programs, global variables can reach erase conditions and synchronization issues. Having them makes reasoning about programs harder. All of a sudden, you don't know what is thread safe and what isn't. There are better ways to model programs that need global state. There's one on screen now. Modeling a program that uses context throughout the entire program is as simple as creating a bunch of methods on a struct that mutate the state of that struct. It's not hard and instantly easy to reason about. Most of the time, global variables are just a cop out. I'm indifferent to global variables though, but they're usually not needed. The average V program isn't a kernel. That's foreshadowing. Uh, if we're talking about heap allocations, you're probably going to ask. What is managing all of this memory? V already avoids doing unnecessary allocations in the first place by using value types, string buffers, no classes, and promoting a simple code style. But you will eventually need to allocate memory on the heap. In short, V provides four ways to manage memory. Manage the whole thing using a tracing garbage collector, manual memory management, arena allocation, or order free. This can all be specified when compiling your program with compiler switches. I'll mostly be talking about order free in the GC here. V uses a garbage collector by default. If hearing GC makes you want to run away, you're probably wrong. Don't trust the GC is slow mantra. When Alex was originally working on V, he was very against it, expecting it to be slow and use a lot more RAM, but actually opposite due to V's design. V's standard library actually manages their own memory explicitly, so don't, users don't need to worry about turning it off. Garbage collection has become so sophisticated in research that previous stereotypes are just completely untrue. And that's what they are. Preconceived notions based on evidence from the 2000s. I've read Rust developers scramble and scratch their heads trying to understand why their program is slower than one that uses a garbage collector. A modern moving garbage collector gets you more allocation throughput, less memory fragmentation, and deferred destruction. Most GCs are up and faster than reference counting while being completely thread safe. So, the, so for the Rust users, no need to wrap everything in arc -tease. V's main solution is order free. It's a compile time switch that automatically inserts free calls for you. It's not default for a reason as it's in beta and requires some more work, but has proved itself. It takes care of about 90 to 100% of objects and the remaining small percentage are freed via GC. Think circular graphs and reference cycles. It's a hybrid approach. It's not full GC. There's not memory management. It's not manual memory management either. The internals of the compiler are currently being rewritten. And after the front end is done, I'll probably come and help work on order free as I have a couple ideas for that myself. You know what uses order free? The Vinix kernel. Vinix is an effort to write a modern, fast, and useful operating system entirely in V. It's Linux based, offering compatibility with its system calls to ease putting software. And it runs Doom because of course it does. There are many things that are completely unsuitable for kernel development. One is garbage collection. Good thing we can switch this up. V uses order, Vinix uses order free with the garbage collection absent. V is a safe language by default, but allows you to write low level code when needed by shoveling it all behind an opt-in layer or compiler switches past the compilation. Vinix uses many of these features. To use globals, which should be rare, 
is allowed using the enable globals compiler switch and the underscore underscore global keyword, which is designed to be an eyesore to declare them. V allows you to write inline assembly, which is useful for things like context switching and other low level operations. Usually point, raw pointer operations on references aren't allowed at all, but V allows you to wrap code in unsafe blocks to do so. Pulling out to C code is also allowed. And in the example below, Vinix is calling out to memset from libc to zero the pointer. I'll quickly go over the features that make V a safe by default language. V performs bounds checking for arrays and other data structures, and those data structures are itself type safe. There are no undefined values and no variable shadowing. So referencing the same value will always refer to the same value, and you can't hide declarations. By default, all variables are immutable, and you have to explicitly declare mutability. You need to declare mutability on function arguments in the declaration and when called. So you'll be able to see if the function mutates an argument at the call site as well. There are no globals, only immutable constants. This is one of my favorite things about V. Balancing practicality with purity from the functional world by introducing immutable values by default and no global state by default. Control flow is explicit and error handling is baked into the type system with option and result types. Generics are also available alongside compile time reflection. V is a modular language and always encourages you to use modules with a built-in centralized package manager. V also asks for composability over inheritance, stepping over the downfalls of OOP. And you can opt into unsafe code with unsafe blocks. To close off, I'll show you a couple idiomatic V programs and libraries. And to finish off the section, I'll walk you through writing a compiler in V for a simple language you've probably heard of. To create a web server, just use the V web framework. It's simple, avoiding global state entirely by having your entire context pass your endpoints, embedding the VWeb base struct. You can call VWeb.run on your context after defining your endpoints, optionally assigning them attributes to functions with the at bracket syntax that govern where they point to, and you're done. You can also use compile time templating, and the, temp and the compiler will generate the native code that templates your HTML for you, following a pretty simple syntax to existing V. Those lines with an at simple prepended are part of the V template language. V also has a built-in object relational mapper, or ORM. Essentially, it's a domain-specific language for working with all SQL databases. V currently supports MySQL, Postgres, SQLite, and Microsoft SQL Server. The ORM provides a number of benefits, such as one syntax for all SQL dialects, so migrating is easier. Queries are constructed using V syntax, meaning they're already sanitized against SQL injection. Compile time checks using V's type system, and readability and simplicity. It just hands you all the objects in the array. I use the ORM for my small blog, combined with the SQLite module and compile time templating. It's been a breeze to work with and makes the code base much more readable. V is a batteries included language, meaning most of everything you'll ever need is already included in the standard library out of the box. Utility, utility libraries, web frameworks, graphics, games, and UI frameworks. On the side is a small sample, all of which is available to use as soon as you install V, except for the VUI framework, which can be installed with just V install UI. I'm not writing a C compiler. I could, but I'll be here for another three hours. We'll try to think simpler, like a brain fart compiler. You've probably heard of it before, but if not, this is how it works. BrainFuck is an esoteric programming language that operates on a very minimal set of instructions. It uses just eight commands which are represented by the individual characters plus, minus, less than, greater than, both square brackets, dots, and comma. The idea behind BrainFuck is just memory manipulation. Basically, you're given an array of 30,000 one-byte memory blocks. Let's say you have a pointer at the start of this long array, and within it, you can increment the pointer, move to the next cell using the right arrow, decrement the pointer, and move to the next cell using, move to the cell before using the left arrow, increment the value of the pointer using the plus character, and decrement the value of the pointer using a minus character. These commands manipulate a memory array consisting of cells, initially set to zero, and a pointer that moves along the array. This is a simple programming language, but useless without things I mentioned. For each language to be Terran complete, meaning it can compute anything given enough time and resources, it must contain conditional branches. Also, not having the ability to perform input or output is pointless too. A functionally pure language is useless without, without I.O. This language has both. The square brackets are used to loop while the cell on entry isn't zero. The dot is used to output the value of the cell at the pointer in ASCII, and the comma is used to read a single character of input into the cell at the pointer. 
Now that we know how the language works, let's write a compiler for it generating WebAssembly. I won't go into detail about WebAssembly. It's just a portable binary format for compiling machine code on the web, which has evolved into a general purpose compilation target. You just have to know that it's like real assembly with opcodes and instructions, and that V supports it, generating WebAssembly modules as a compilation target, and for use as a library, generating WebAssembly inside your, inside your program. I created this library to assist myself in writing the WebAssembly sections of the V compiler. The same one that's exposed to the standard library is the same one that's used when you compile V to WebAssembly. The API is pretty simple, and on the slide is the example used on the modules documentation page. To create, cre it creates a module to hold everything, then creates a function, then adds instructions to it, then commits it to the module, and then compiles it to a byte array. You'll be able to follow along with the code. I'll start with the main function. We want the arguments supplied to the program, so just index into os.args, and if it's not there, print a usage message and return. The rest is just a skeleton for the rest of the program. We'll fill that in later. This just creates a module, as well as a function called underscore star, and exporting it. At the end of the program, it'll just compile the WebAssembly module and write it to the disk. How WebAssembly interfaces with the outside environment, outside of the web, it uses WASI, or the WebAssembly system interface. Here, we just import the functions that we need from it, ones to read and write from the outside world. We also need memory to store the cells of the program, so we assign it here. The underscore start function is special. It's a convention in WASI to have a function called underscore start, which is the entry point for the program. On Unix-based operating systems that use the alpha executable format, it shares the same name as well. What we're actually doing here is looping over each character and matching on each. Each character that isn't a valid part of the program is ignored, then just comments. I've created a variable or local in WebAssembly terms called SP. This is the pointer that is just an index to the current cell. We're also keeping tra track of the labels for the loops and blocks so we can jump to them later. These are for the operations with the square bracket characters. The implementations of the operations just shuffle the pointer around and increment and decrement values are pretty straightforward. Just a read, increment, write for the first one. And for ones that need to read from memory, it takes a little more effort, but not much more. The load eight function on the right takes whatever value it has and uses it to load a byte from memory. False meaning the value doesn't need to be signed and zero meaning the address has an alignment of one and an offset of zero. Unless you're planning on doing some WebAssembly stuff, you don't need to know this. I've included these implementations for completeness sake as well. WebAssembly has structured control flow, meaning it takes on an approach with blocks, loops, and if expressions, rather than a bunch of labels and go-tos like you'd see in assembly, pretty similar to V. The code on the left for reading and printing are both similar, except the printing operation works in standard out, and the reading operation works in standard in. All it takes to generate code for this language, really, is just to iterate over the characters in the source code and generate, and then, and generate the appropriate instructions for each. We just did that. Up after implementing those operations, you can call the program and run the output in a WebAssembly runtime. What's on the slide is a simple cat program, which just outputs exactly what is input. If my pull request pass, which it probably did by now, you'll be able to find the sample which used inside this presentation in the examples directory of V. This is just a pretty pr quick example on how to use V to write compilers. For complex programming languages, V's type system and compiler itself is written in V, as well as a couple of compilers I've worked on myself. Before I got here, I also ran a couple benchmarks using Hyperphone. The entire V compile, compiler compiles itself in about 1.2 seconds. The other two are the pretty, they're pretty large programs, one of which is a full stack VWeb app and a Tetris game that uses V's graphics libraries. They both compile in less than a second. V chooses to compile programs as fast as possible by default while still doing a lot of checks. One way to, th to think is assuming that performance at runtime is the most important thing and that you should sacrifice compile time speed. It's a valid point, but how would you achieve those goals without a fast compiler? Iteration is the key to progress, and no one gets anything done on the first build. How enjoyable is it when a full recompilation of your project takes half an hour? That's why I use C instead of C++ when I need to, because changing a single line in a header file is slightly less painful in C. I'm happy to live with the worst language ergonomics because I know I'll be able to build things faster. I'm glad I don't have to make that compromise in V. And if you believe that recompiling in two to three seconds is acceptable, think again. Consider tests, loads of them. A good compiler demands excessive testing, and each test takes a brief moment, but there are probably thousands. A fast compiler is a productive compiler, and a productive compiler is a good compiler. I'll finish up here. 
B is probably the most interesting programming language community I've been a part of and had the pleasure of working with. Beginners and new contributors come and go all the time, and most have had a positive experience. People want to make engines, languages, libraries, and frameworks from scratch. No one tells people to stop reinventing the wheel like I've seen in other communities. For this reason, I've actively enjoyed contributing to V, and I've learned a lot from it. Here is where I want to conclude my talk. Thank you so much for sitting through this, and I hope you enjoyed it. I'm releasing the entire source code for this presentation, all 2,600 lines, including script, written in typist markup, and when I get it, I host a video out there as well. If you want to talk with me or absolutely everything, uh, absolutely anything, you can email me or find more convenient contacts on my website. My primary project right now is a programming language and optimizing compiler, so I'll probably need test subjects. And that concludes. That was amazing. Uh, before we let Liam go, I was wondering, did anyone have uh, any questions? Absolutely anything. Oh, it's a yeah. bit personal, so feel free to not answer if you don't want to. But what's next for you? What are your plans going forward? Like in my, in my life? Oh, I don't I don't even know what uni I'm going to go to. Oh, really? <laughs> like an early entry. Um, yeah. Uh, yes? Um, so I see like be currently you're kind of um, more using like sort of with the sort of mm -hmm. vibe. Is that true? Like, or are you trying to? It's a general purpose language, which means you can use it for anything. Uh, like compiler development. Um, the WebAssembly backend that I'm working on right now has an experimental uh, thing to compile for browser targets. That means you can declare JavaScript functions inside your code and use them. Uh, but I built websites with it, the backend. It, it won't replace JavaScript, but it does compile to JavaScript. Right, I see. Um, so, like, is there a sort of goal? So, like, for example, like, like Python is a general purpose language, but no one really uses it for like anything but like down a sign, right? So, that, that, that's kind of like the direction I was like heading towards. Is there like anything you're envisioning with B? Or do you think B would just be like such a superior language that everything should be written? Well, that's kind of like the Rust way. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's a general purpose programming language. So do anything in it. Sure. I write shell scripts in it as well. Right. Uh, yep. Right. Um, well, Aditya is asking, where did you learn all the other languages? Oh, I have a lot of free time. <laughs> uh, I'm, yeah, I don't do anything else. Uh, yep. Yeah. So, um, I think this is like you probably might get sick of hearing this question, but like, do you feel like there are any negatives with V? Like, oh, of course. Or, um, so right. they are a lot of. Uh, continue your question if you're. Oh, okay. I was like, because since you actively help with it. Yes. So I, I know I I've read the compiler like through, and I'm not I the the in, the compiler right now is currently being rewritten. But right now, it is probably not the most sophisticated compiler out there. It doesn't have an intermediate representation. It generates code from, from the syntax tree. Uh, so what I want to do is eventually when they rewrite the parser, so the parser will be multi-threaded. After they finish rewriting the parser, I'll probably uh, do some work uh, in the internals of the compiler and just make it even better. It's, uh, it generates some, um, it doesn't have uh, a way of stripping out functions. So the binaries can, it generates a lot of C code. And after optimizations, it'll remove those. But V should be able to do that already. But they're implementing that now. Okay. Um, yeah, so yeah. I think, um, like, like for me, right, personally, um, I agree with you, like Python's easy to write, C is hard to like, yeah. write, right? Um, my solution was always C++, right? Um, and I think from your talk, you kind of mentioned, I think, what I understood was these biggest advantage is compilation time and PDC++. Is there anything else V is like superior? Uh, C interop, and it has um, a lot of these things uh, built in as language features. So with C++, you would have to install Boost. You would have to use these other, other things. But C++ has everything. It's a batteries included language. Instead of C++, the way they get standard library features is that they go to a committee and it takes 10 years. So that, that's why I would use V. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. So um, V follows a very similar threading model and uh, like like synchronization model to Go. So you, it uses channels, mutexes, and things like that. And also the ability to not have global variables 
means that uh, synchronization is much easier and immutable data means that it's much easier to reason about. Um, yeah, so V has, I didn't, I didn't touch on constructs for multi-threading. V has keywords uh, similar to Go. So it has the Go keyword for running things in a concurrent, um, like uh, I think stackless coroutines. And um, V has also has the spawn keyword. It, it spawn uh, spawns a new OS thread. So yeah. Uh, yes. Brian's asking, can you put it? Can you put this on a microcontroller? Yeah, it's it's C. It's C. So it generate it generates C code. Um, I would I would probably I probably I'd probably wait until uh our native backend works uh does pretty well, but it writes C. So you'd be able to. I think there's I think there's AVR modules for uh, V already on Git. So and a follow up: uh, How much time do you dedicate to learning languages, projects, CS topics, and stuff like that? Oh, it's just my hobby. So every waking moment. Yeah. Yes. So, I don't know this. Uh, so like when you talk about you working with an open source community and like you have a lot of experiences with that, how does that generally go in terms of like making big changes? Like when you're talking about things like, you know, rewrite the compile stuff. Like okay. That. So in big changes, usually, uh, so our primary, our primary way of communication with V is discord. Cause it's just, it's just so easy. And, um, so when you want to make a big change like that, you just let everyone know. You start developing the change in a separate branch, and then you do a PR, like a big pull request. And then there's just kind of like back and forth with contributors. Um, I've never really had I've never really had a change that would be denied. I've I've like I've requested some like syntax changes, but it's been denied on on the on the grounds of uh, keeping V a simple language, which I agree with. Yeah. So I I'm kind of more with that then. So is there any sort of hierarchy in like hierarchy? Systems? Um yeah, so no, not really. So um, I think anyone can make changes, and if they're accepted by a lot of the people, like um, uh, yeah, and then uh, they're able to be pushed in. So I think V's main organizational like of like leadership, you just get put in. You just get like uh, yeah. I don't think it has one, <laughs> but yeah, I think pe people just people just make changes, and it's a big team effort. We'll probably wrap it up there unless there are any last minute questions here on this side. Oh, um, like performance wise, so um, like Python is notorious for like being like very slow. C C plus plus like kind of fast and fastest. What do you think about these like performance and one time performance? So what you don't want to do when you create a programming language is use like LLVM and then maintain it for years. So what V does is it just compiles C, and that means you get access to like optimizing C compilers. So it just runs as fast as C. Awesome. We'll probably uh, wrap it up there. The pizza is just about here. There'll be plenty of opportunity to speak with uh, Liam about the project. Uh, we'll give him a final round of applause. Right. Uh, yeah, I just want to say a quick thank you to Liam. You know, I think we can all agree he's got a very bright future. Um, like a lot of the stuff you talked about is what we learned in first and second year, and you're already doing this in year 11. Yeah. So, congratulations on all you kind of congratulations on all you've done. It's really yeah. amazing. All right. Um, just to wrap it up. Uh, yeah.